So thank you everyone for arriving. And for those of you who came pre one o'clock, thank you for being super early. And now that it's post one o'clock, we can actually start this inside innovation, um, co-designing with newcomers. We are gonna take about two hours. Um, and like I said, we're gonna try and use these tools so that we can have a bit of an interactive conversation, at least for a portion of the day. But the first thing we're gonna do is start with a land acknowledgement, which I'm gonna hand over to Mathera. Uh, hi everyone. Thank you all for being here. And uh, we're gathered here together right now at what is essentially the threshold of this virtual experience. Uh, so we wanted to take a few minutes to actually meet you there and welcome you in and ground ourselves in this moment. Um, so if you're comfortable doing so, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. And again, if you're comfortable, I'll invite you to join me in taking a couple of deep breaths together. So inhaling deeply, either through your nose or your mouth, and exhaling with ease through your mouth. So inhale. And exhale. Now keeping your eyes closed, feel free to continue to breathe in this way as you listen. I wanna start by acknowledging that we're all showing up to this presentation from very different places. And while we may not have left our homes this morning to go into work, it's likely that we've already traveled through a whole range of physical, mental, emotional, and possibly even spiritual states as we've made our way through this day. For many of us, as our entire lives unfold within the four walls of our homes, we find ourselves shifting back and forth between different identities, parent, partner, child, employee, student, volunteer, friend, chef, cleaner, teacher, and that list goes on. And we transition through these states and these identities so quickly sometimes that we don't notice when we have left one state and one identity and entered another. So today, as you step over this threshold with us, I invite you to breathe, to arrive, and to land. Toronto, or Tuckeronto, as it's been called since long before we arrived on this land, is also known as the gathering place. And while we may not be physically gathering today, it's important to acknowledge that so much of our existence is still nurtured by this land. This land continues to provide the food that we eat, the oxygenated air that we breathe, the floors that we rest our feet on, the roofs over our heads, and even the component parts of the devices that we're currently tuning in on are derived from this land. We are still learning to revere and honor this land in the ways that it deserves. We are still learning to seek guidance from those who have been listening to this land for a long, long time. The Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the other First Nations whose names remain unrecorded, all of whom have been listening to this land for a long time and caring for it accordingly. There may be moments during this presentation today when you're distracted, moments where your body is here but the rest of you is somewhere else, and that's okay. In those moments, I invite you to come back to the simple yet powerful practice of feeling your feet on the ground and allowing yourself to be held by this land. Now, before you open your eyes to take in what lies on the other side of this threshold, I invite you to take another deep breath. <sighs> Welcome. Thank you, Mathera. Um, 
we want to make sure that when we do land acknowledgements and that when we do the work that we've been doing, that we always ground them in this meditation. Um, most of our um, workshops with both the youth researchers and with staff have always started this way and we hope that you enjoyed um, and were able to take those deep breaths and come into this space with us. We know that the journey of entering a space feels a lot different than what it usually uh, feels like. Um, and so maybe you didn't scramble into finding the directions of where this new place is um, today, but we know that um, the, the, the weight of what we're gonna share with you over the next couple hours can also feel like time and attention uh, are very different than what they used to be. So hi, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm Jen. I am a design facilitator, researcher, and evaluator by profession. I joined the Niche team last June, um, and I, my title is the Innovation and Experimentation Coach. Um, uh, again, I'm just gonna remind you that if you are also um, on the Twitters, uh, that we're using hashtag niche innovation and niche online. Um, and so I am one of, of the innovation and experimentation, experimentation team. Uh, I'm in the, I, I guess I sit at the manager level, um, but really our team is, is so much bigger than just me. Um, so Mathura was the one who, who ushered you into this conversation with our land acknowledgement. Um, she was our she is our innovation and design facilitator. There are two more people on the line, um, Azzy and Abdul, who are prototype researchers. And the four others who you'll be hearing from today are just four of our youth researcher crew. Um, so Daisy, Eros, Mark, um, Daisy, Mark, Eros, and Lu Louise. Oh my God, the f it's only four names and somehow I seem to feel like I'm always missing out on someone. Um, and then Shelly is also here as our executive director. Um, a little bit about our flow today. Um, we are going to try and get situated for about 30 minutes. So that's this part where we're gonna jump in and out of this slide deck and into the Google Slides. Um, we're also going to be in the chat boxes. So it's gonna feel a lot like the part of when you come to a workshop and we do that mingly bit. Um, we were really hoping that we would be able to make this as interactive as possible. Again, from the safety of your non-videoed, non-voices um, in the room. Um, and so um, we're gonna spend about 30 minutes doing that work. Um, and so if there are some bumps and things in that, feel free to use the chat um, to grab our attention. Um, and then we're gonna share the work for about 60 minutes. And then we're gonna have a moderated Q&A. Um, and what that means is uh, as questions are popping up throughout the presentation, feel free to add comments and questions and whatnot into the chat window. Um, someone on our team will always be monitoring those. And if there are questions that we feel like we can answer sort of simply in a chat box, we'll do that. Um, but there are some questions that are like a little bit longer or weightier or you know everyone might want to pay attention to um, and so what we'll do is we'll actually have that in what we're calling the moderated q a so mathura and i will mathura will actually like read out questions that have come up during the chat um, so that we can do that and then we'll actually open it up this is the part where your microphones would come on um, if you so choose to um, we'll have you put your voices into the room and that's sort of um, moving us towards the end of our time together so this is your turn where the the engagement part comes in again so we're still going to remind you to use the chat and the google slides i'm going to go out of SlideShare um, so that we can actually see where everyone is in the google slides so hello to jules from techfugees albert from u of t hi daniela hi adam hi sahar Emily and Marco sharing a post-it note. <laughs> Once you've moved on from the hello slide, there's one more slide um, starting at slide 12 called why. So what brought you here today? So 
we're going to get you to do those two slides. And then as tempting as it's going to be to dive further into the slide deck, we're going to ask you to hold on to that anticipation because we'd like to be able to walk you through that process as opposed to you jumping forward. Um, obviously, we can't stop everyone from doing that, but you know. Um, also keep in mind that this slide deck is our main presentation deck. So if you do go moving things around, um, that impacts everybody. <laughs> Don't worry, we have a backup version, but just be aware of like how we're all moving and impacting each other, just like we would in other real space. So thank you for people who are popping into the Y spaces. Someone's looking forward to hearing about the challenges and the successes. We have lots of those to share. <laughs> So we really appreciate everyone sharing their um, their their whys with us. We we know that a bunch of you shared with us during your registration, um, and so as we were reading each one and trying to design and figure out this workshop, we really wanted to make sure that we were trying to hit as many needs as possible, um, but also trying to remember like where the work is sitting, um, and so we wanted to make sure that there was space for that conversation to happen between all of you. Okay, I can read out a couple more while we're waiting. Thank you. Um, thinking through sector future in other venues, wanted to see what you've been working on. I admire the work of Niche and their approach to, approach to innovation. Thank you. So yeah, one of the reasons we wanted to um, kind of start off by asking about what you wanted to learn is one thing that we've learned through our work um, doing innovation is, at Niche is really taking the time to understand why people show up um, and knowing that when people choose to engage with you in any way there's an expectation that they have of, of what they're going to get but also an opportunity cost. So you're here and that means you're taking on additional screen time in your day and you're here with an expectation. So the screen time is kind of like the opportunity cost, other things, um, but you're also here with an expectation of what you might wanna learn. And I think taking this into account is important for us because it helps us value our participants' time and manage their expectations and really share enough information from the get-go so they can decide whether they want to opt in or not. Um, one way that we did this with the Youth Researcher Program, which we'll tell you a little bit about uh, later, is after our first session where we kind of outline what the program was um, and what you know, they may be doing in the program, we gave them uh, an exit ticket and it asked them kind of where they were at. Um, do you feel ready? Do you feel like you have more questions or do you feel like you wanna leave and not come back? And I think it was kind of surprising um, for some of the re youth researchers to see that there was a, an option to leave and not come back. And I think for us, that was important because we wanna respect their time and the amount of energy that they're investing in this. Uh, and in the same way, we want to respect your time and the energy that you're investing in showing up for this presentation. So in the next couple of slides, Jen will share with you kind of the flow for the day and what we'll be going through. And if at any point you feel like, eh, this is not for me, it doesn't feel like it's covering exactly what I'm what I'm here for, um, you have all the permission to leave. Um, there will be a recording of this. And if there are other questions that just don't get answered in the session, we are accessible to you after. Um, so kind of our big learning from this is create opportunities for informed choice instead of making people feel like um, they have to say, stay because they've signed up for something. Yeah, I think that was really huge for us, especially with the youth researchers, which like Mathura said, we'll talk a little bit more later, but th that was a job. So how many of us show up for a job not knowing entirely the details and then getting into it and feeling like, oh, this isn't for me, but now I feel tied to it because I've signed a contract, I've made a commitment. Um, but then you're not doing justice to the work um, and, and, and vice versa. So that was really big for us. Now I'm gonna try and move my slides. 
So we are going to get you to jump back into the Google Slides. I'm not going to go out of this because that makes me scared. Um, but so this is one of our big questions. Um, we again started all of our work uh, or workshops with this question, hopes and fears. So again, we wanted to share this space and time with you to find out what are your hopes and fears about doing innovation within the nonprofit sector. Oh, you can't edit the slides if you're in presentation mode. Okay, well then I guess I will go out of the slides. Thanks, Marco. Okay, I went out. You can all hop into the, there's hope slides and then there's fear slides. I can see a bunch of you, I can see a bunch of your anonymous animals showing up in the hopes and fears slide. So I assume that means that you're getting in there. I've shared the link again in case it's too far up in the chat. Um, one thing about hopes and fears is that while we may describe them in broad strokes, they're actually, they tend to be quite specific. Like for example, if one of your fears is around innovation is like, I have this really great idea, but I know if I bring it to my boss and I'm going to get stuck doing it, like that's a very specific fear. And then like the more specific the hopes and the fears are, um, the better we're able to kind of work with it and share that with each other and make that visible. Um, so as you're, as you're writing down your hopes and your fears, um, you know, challenge yourself to tap into some of that detail that tends to exist when we, when we think about hopes and fears in our heads. Oh, it's like magic when it just all pops up at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so lots of hopes in there about better coordination of services for clients. Um, being able to create impact that has longer lasting and more significant impact on intended users that there's an alignment between capacity of the community with the needs and the capacity of the, of the community for, organ, for innovation. Being able to support a broad range of ideas. Being able to be innovative in this mode. I imagine that whoever wrote that is talking about like in the pandemic mode, um, or do you mean like in the virtual mode? Having innovation or innovating, being normalized and less feared and open space to share ideas. I can start reading out some of the fears on the flip yeah. side. Um, too much, a fear being too much focus on innovation and service gets lost. So it's almost like innovation has to happen separately from, from service. Um, again, basic service, getting lost in executing innovation. Um, so how do you kind of integrate those two, what seems like two different worlds? Um, not knowing where to draw the line between co consulting and co-creating with users and when to take charge and drive this is very real. Uh, ideas, see, sorry, go oh, ahead. Sorry, I see both funding and lack of funding for an mm. innovation designed for users. Right. Ideas being shut down by risk averse managers and funders. And the idea of like risk comes up quite a bit around innovation being having a certain level of risk and that not being um, that not all organizations are ready to take that risk. These are so great. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing and for kind of rising to the challenge of naming some of the really specific hopes and fears that you know, we all carry. Okay. Um, so again, this was, we, we see the value of kind of talking about hopes and fears from the get go, but this is also a way for um, us to kind of let you into some of the tools that we use 
both as an internal innovation experimentation team, but also when we engage with the youth researchers, this is an activity that we like to start off with um, because our hopes and fears exist whether we share them or not. So this is just a matter of making something that's, that tends to be invisible visible. And whether we talk about our hopes or, and fears or not, they inevitably influence how we show up in a space, how we react to ideas that are put forth, and even how we kind of interact with each other, because we might be responding from a place of, you know, a, a hope not coming true or a fear being realized. Um, and we've seen that talking about hopes and fears, particularly at the start of a project and continuing to, as, as you move through a project, can actually contribute to building a safe space, uh, or rather a brave space, um, and actually creates room for, uh, someone mentioned that there, you know, there's not a lot of tolerance for debate. When you're able to share your hopes and your fears, you can debate from a place of, place of uh, empathy and compassion. Uh, and one thing that we found really, really important was making it uh, anonymous. So for I think most of you were able to get into the uh, Google Slides as anonymous animals. And when we do this in, in a group, we do it anonymously, where kind of people write their hopes and fears on sheets of paper, we throw them around the room, and then you pick up and read somebody else's. Um, so anonymity is huge to guarantee that safety. Um just to sort of switch gears. Um, we're gonna get into the flow of the workshop now. This is the part where we're gonna do a lot more of the talking, but thank you so much for, for joining us in, the, in this brave space. For right now, I'm gonna hand it over to Shelly. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, can you hear me, everyone? Yep. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, so I'm gonna just talk for a couple minutes right now, just to give you a little bit of a, uh, some more information about North York Community House, or as we call it, niche. And a little bit, just a very, uh, just a, a bit on our approach to innovation. So um, uh, you see on the slide, it, it talks a little bit about uh, North York Community House. I just want to tell you a couple more things. Um, we're a neighborhood center in Northwest Toronto that's been in existence for 30 years. It's actually our 30th anniversary this year. And we're really sad that we can't have a big in-person party to celebrate because we, as an organization, we like big in-person events. So uh, we're gonna have to figure another way to celebrate. Um, we focus on two primary areas. Uh, one is supporting newcomers in Canada to settle and thrive and belong. And to do that, we have a variety of programs. Uh, we have English classes, one-to-one -one and group uh, settlement services, employment and mentoring programs, children and youth programs, social mentoring programs tailored for refugees, a whole range of programs. And these programs are primarily funded by Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada, or IRCC as uh, most of us um, call it and the provincial government. Uh, we also have a new and exciting program that's funded by IRCC that's just starting to develop active citizenship programs for newcomers. The second area that uh, the organization focuses on is around civic engagement and community development. And that includes uh, supporting our participants and our community members to enhance their leadership skills, to become more civically engaged, and to work together to make improvements or changes or positive changes in their neighborhoods or communities. And these programs are primarily funded by United Way of Greater Toronto and the City of Toronto. So I wanna give a thanks to the funders. Those are our major funders. We have a number of other smaller funders. Um, just wanna say a couple words about uh, Niche's approach to innovation and as innovation is, it's always evolving as we learn and do more, but I'll just tell you kind of where we see it right now um, in, a, in a few different ways. It's not the whole approach, but it's, it gives you a bit of an example. Uh, one of the big things is uh, for us, um, innovation is always connected to learning and always looking to increase our impact in the community uh, and for the people we work with. Um, it, there's, that's always the, uh, the increasing impact and, and uh, is always a, 
a big piece of why or the piece of why we do it. Uh, innovation for us can be big or small. It can be related to change, changing or developing new programs, or it could be related to how we work. But as I mentioned, the ultimate goal is uh, always around greater impact. Uh, for us, uh, innovation is also very much connected to experimentation. We feel it's important to provide a variety of opportunities and ways for staff to innovate and experiment. They need to feel safe to try new things. They need to be given some time to do it and know it's okay if it doesn't all work out. Um, the, the, what we learn is, is very important and it increases um, our sense of, of next time what can work and what can't. Um, what we, one of the ways that we've, um, um, one of the ways that we've uh, kind of worked in innovation is uh, we support uh, staff to identify potential innovations and, um, and changes because they, they're the ones in a, uh, the, that know best about what works in programs, they and, and the people that we work with. Um, if it's a smaller innovation that they can do in programs, they try it out and see what happens and learn. If it's a bigger one um, that needs additional resources or larger changes, then it, and then it involves a few more steps. Um, so one, once staff surface an idea, uh, they need to provide a rationale to the management team for the innovation. And then if it's a strong case and it fits with our priorities, we try to make it happen to find the resource, resources needed, to find time for them to do it, et cetera. So that, that's kind of one of our, kind of one piece of our approach and um, around uh, working uh, in innovation in it. So I'm gonna stop there and later I'll come back to talk more about lessons learned. Thanks, Shelley. Um, so, like Shelley said, we are mo mostly funded out of Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada, which is IRCC, and so this project, this work, really wouldn't be possible except for the fact that IRCC started in 2018 um, a fund called the Service Delivery Improvements Fund, um, which was specifically to increase efficiency and effectiveness informed by user-centered design. Um, you can see the, the principles and the approaches um, there, and you'll see how this is woven into the work and the way in which we've done this project throughout. Um, but I just wanted to say that, um, you know, again, it's really not possible unless you have funding that responds and supports the intentions of the work. So what is innovation? I am not going to go into definitions of innovation, but I did want to call um, attention to the fact that, we, that we've noticed within the innovation sector that there's sort of like two versions of innovation. Um, what we're calling big I innovation, which you might know um, and might sound familiar when people use thing, terminology like new, next, future. Um, it's often very polished and curated and it feels a little bit exclusive. Um, it often is expert-led or visionary or even award-winning. Um, and then there's little eye innovation, which is heads down, experimenting in small ways, and it's often too busy and sometimes too humble to share. And I think that one of the major pieces that I've observed and we've observed through doing this work is that we sit um, sort of teetering back and forth between big eye and little eye, and we're not really always sure what we're trying to achieve, where which camp we're supposed to be in. Um, and that I think that niche mostly sits in the little eye innovation where heads down and we're doing things. Um, our, our frontline workers in particular are experimenting in new ways all the time and sometimes they're just doing it so regularly that they don't think of it as innovation and that was one of the things that um, as part of the new innovation sort of department within niche um, I was observing and saying okay how do we actually call out more and bring more attention to the work that we are already doing. Um, and also how we come to the work. Um, so there's a lot of you on the line who might be sitting in one, one or, uh, or either of these two bubbles of the Venn diagram. Um, and, and so what we wanted to sort of say is also depending on how you're coming to this workshop, you're listening for different things and you're craving different results 
from what we're talking about. Um, and that's okay. Just remember that we couldn't, you know, there's, there's eight different stakeholder groups in this group, um, in, this, in this slide. And so we're trying to make something available, but we're also trying to make sure that we're not diluting what we're sharing. Um, and so you might sit in the, the, the category of people who work with and for nonprofits. Um, so those are innovation and design professionals, funders and philanthropists, public servants, academia. And then there's the, 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 the people who actually work in nonprofits. So we're nonprofit and social service frontline workers, we're program managers, we're senior leadership, we're volunteers. There's a really different, we work in really different systems and processes and timing um, when we're in, when we're either in the in category or when we're in the with and for category. And so those pieces need to come together to be able to do innovation. It's not going to happen in one or the other category. Okay. And one thing that we that became clear pretty quickly when we when we started was that our tools are not enough. So Jen and I both have design backgrounds to some extent. Um, we've had formal training in um, design and innovation. And one thing that was kind of pretty clear starting starting out was that organizations are at risk of being over innovated. And what that means is you come in and you say we're going to we're going to do innovation, and that sounds like that sounds like more work and we're already under resource and we're already stretching our our money our time our attention our energy our empathy um and when you come in with with new tools without having built the relationships that really affects how people um want to invest in what you're doing um there's a lot of kind of resistance to you know another new idea that the frontline workers will have to implement um, without really having had a say in how that idea is designed um, and put forth. And it affects how people feel included in the process. So I think one thing that we've learned is as much as we can, we can come in with great tools, um, people need to trust us first before they can trust the tools that we bring. Um, and it's really, really important to move at the speed of trust, even if um, that is not the speed that we're used to moving in the with and for category if we're coming from that space. There. So like Mathura said that we really needed to make sure that our approach when we were coming into this innovation work um, was um, I don't even want to say 50 50 but that we were bringing our tools and our processes like interviews and brainstorming and prototyping and feedback which are fairly like typical innovation tools um, but we were met with um, a growing need to make relationships with staff and leadership and peer-to-peer -peer and community and then also rely on the existing relationships that staff have with each other that leadership have with staff that that's going on because what people are talking about the innovation work feeling like um, that impacts how and when they want to participate and so it was really big for us to take a to take a pause and be like hey we're the new people here we don't want to come in and say this is how you should be doing this we wanted to take time and and watch and learn and and reflect and integrate ourselves into what was happening. Um, our tools are only as good as they are in practice. Um, otherwise, they're just all theory. So we started this project with this big question, which is how might we co-design programs and services with our hardest to reach populations. So Niche was noticing two populations specifically emerge as around but hard to meet, hard to connect with, and hard to serve. Um, and that was Arabic speaking men and Filipino youth. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the process of how we, we did this work um, with those populations. So our project goals are testing and using client-centric research to do idea generation and prototyping, and then training and building capacity to build a stronger culture of innovation and experimentation within the organization. We worked for 21 months. So this project started in September of 2018 and will end in June of 2020. Um, and we see it as happening in two really specific phases. There was this phase of learning innovation tools. So how were we 
um, practicing and using tools. We were working with consultants to do research. We did an initial phase of idea generation and prototyping. And then in October, we were reflecting on what we had done in, in the learning um, and decided that we needed to pivot into investing in innovation and experimentation at an organizational level. So we, we stopped, we paused, um, we took a moment and we decided that we needed to be taking an asset-based approach and we needed to be piloting innovative practices within the organization and seeing how people responded to those practices as a way to decide if those are the ways in which we should be even moving forward. Um, and so what we're going to focus on for the remainder of this webinar is piloting the innovative practices. So this is a very big slide with a lot of information. I'm not gonna go into all of it. Um, this is something that you can look back on later, but when we were talking about piloting innovative practices with three sort of main stakeholder groups, um, we had our niche staff as one stakeholder group as we were building uh, capacity and culture for innovation and experimentation. We had Arabic speaking men and then we had Filipino youth. Um, all of them sort of started out on a similar trajectory. We had interviews with Arabic speaking men. We did program observation. Um, at some point we got to pulling quotes and out of those um, interviews into themes and profile cards. Um, we were identifying specific pain points within those groups. Um, and then we did some idea generation, which in some cases was co. So with the participants actually involved through design labs. And then some of it was more in the four category. Um, when for the Arabic speaking men, we, we are in the process of still developing a business planning tool. Um, and then being able to pilot those ideas. So doing staff training and starting one-on-one -on -one coaching with staff. We have yet to actually pilot ideas with the Arabic speaking men. Um, and then with the Filipino uh, youth, we did, there's a podcast um, as well as the youth researchers program. Um, we really felt like it was important to have deeply embedded design principles as we were approaching the work. As the innovation team, we do sort of sit on that cusp of with and for, but even though we're in an organization. Um, and so we're sort of approaching it as um, the people who are serving everyone else that's working in the organization. So we felt like we needed to, we, we wanted to come from a place, um, from a stance. Um, so we believe that we can blend the lived experiences of newcomers and the service delivery knowledge of niche staff into the development of new ideas. We wanted to make sure we had a strong foundation for innovation and experimentation that was built from an asset-based approach. And that participation in the design process should always feel easy and intuitive. Um, and that there's a value in testing ideas, but also making it safe to grieve and let go of ideas that are no longer working. And this came from conversations that we were having with staff, with participants, um, from work that we had been doing previously. And so we wanted to make sure that we were embedding what we were hearing, um, both as aspirational, but also very practical. Just to add quickly to okay, that, sorry. Um, the piece around making it safe to grieve, a couple of you mentioned a fear of failure, um, both at the leadership level, but also at the frontline level, um, as kind of a fear around innovation. This idea of making it normal to test things and making it normal for things not to work out and making it normal for you to let go. It's actually better to let go of things earlier when you pilot them and they're not working. Um, we found that adopting that mindset from the get go actually helped um, build in a little bit more tolerance around failure and actually seeing it as a lesson rather than a failure. Yeah, it gave us permission to try things out that, you know, we weren't really sure of the results. So um, this is the part where we get into some of the like meteor uh, information. Um, so we were building staff capacity. So we had three sort of core pieces within the innovation work. We had an internal innovation committee, which was nine staff of frontline workers, of training staff and of, of administration who acted as our sounding board. They also supported us in doing some of our staff interviews. Um, so we were, we had, we didn't have the capacity to interview everyone. And so we trained some of our, of our existing niche staff to be able to support us in that work. And they made warm introductions for us to participants. That was huge. Um, we would not have been able to run this program with as much, um, 
relationship already built in, except for the fact that trust has already been established with our frontline workers. Um, we had an innovation and experimentation team, so four of us. Um, I've already introduced Mathura um, and Abdul and Azzi are both on the on the line as well, um, and as well as me. So we we made up the innovation and experimentation team, and we were able to. We hosted weekly salad clubs. It sounds a little silly, but bringing together people with just two salad ingredients we made these like collaborative salad bars every week and we would invite staff to just come and have lunch with us and chat and and share ideas with us and that was how we built a lot of relationships um it was over food and it was impromptu um and it really changed the way in which people received when we asked and invited them into process um, we hosted a design lab, the first ever design lab um, at Niche, um, which I will talk a little bit more about later. We were, we, and then as a team, we were responsible for research, observation, facilitation, and program development. Um, and then our youth researchers, we had 21 youth researchers commit to joining a program that was kind of vague, um, but that they were willing to jump into this process of let's be researchers, let's share our own lived experience, but let's also find out about what's happening with our peers and with our family. So they shared their lived experience through their stories, through conversations. They also um, conducted peer-to-peer -peer research. So they went and did interviews. They did team um, research together. They did self uh, research. And then they participated in forming the program and service design. And they did that through every interaction that we had with them. So like I said, we had our first staff design lab in February, um, and that was coming out of, we had, we, had, we had done a whole bunch of interviews with staff to find out what innovation is at Niche. We weren't looking for sort of textbook definitions. We were trying to understand where it was already happening in pockets with, with staff and in programming. Um, and what we found and, we, and was elevated was that staff really wanted to be able to collaboratively program design across teams, across the organization. And so we were able to work, we were able to do that across everything um, from leadership, to frontline and, and horizontally as well. Um, but not only share ideas, but able to filter ideas and then choose ideas to actually move forward. Um, and then it was time to just learn together, to share, to make space, um, to try out innovation tools, but also to see what it was like to spend one full day sort of in this like innovation and design process. And I think one thing that uh, came out of this, which we've already stressed, is this notion that our staff are already innovative um, in the small I way often. Um, and they're engaging in creative pro problem solving every day. And this is born out of necessity, not because we have extra funding or we can, we can do this. Um, and I think that really humbled us and shaped how we made the design lab and all the other uh, opportunities to participate available to the staff. Um, we would ask them questions, not just in like formal interviews um, or in the design lab, but like in passing, if we had a question and something came up, like we would pop over and say like, hey, do you have some time to chat about this? We're not really sure how to move forward. Um, and they, they, they have the knowledge and are willing to share and they just want to be asked. Um, but then also being able to shape some of our engagement around their priorities. So checking in to see like, what are the challenges that you're seeing front and center? Like, are we not seeing what you're seeing? Um, and then using the words that they give you, the knowledge that they give you to kind of shape the decision making. So for example, as a really tangible example, we used um, specific quotes that we pulled from the interviews that we had done with staff and put them around the staff design lab so other staff could see what they had said but also so, so the staff that had shared could see themselves reflected in our process and know that you know we're not making these things up this comes from you um, and part of it was also knowing that you know staff have calls all the time with particularly settlement workers and they're often catering to their client schedules so with our design lab we made it so that people could come in and out and stay for as long as they'd like and what was reflected back was that that was really helpful um, for people to, to participate, but then leave when they had to leave. 
Um, and ultimately what we learned is that we can plant as many seeds for innovation as we might like, but the staff are really the keepers of, of that, those plants and they need to really need, want to nurture it um, for, the, for those ideas to really take root and grow and um, kind of flourish into our programming. Yeah, I'm, I think like just to echo what Mathura is saying, it's like the, the innovation can't live in an organization if the staff don't want it to be there. Um, so moving into our next sort of two pieces, this is a flow diagram. Um, it, it ties back to that, that table that I shared earlier, so it might be helpful if you have both of them open. But just a bit to go through the process, um, with Arabic speaking men, there was about 25 interviews that were conducted and there were specific pain points that were addressed. So securing employment, it seems very obvious that newcomers are interested in gaining secure employment, but within that process, um, they're frustrated, they're setbacks, they're missing out on being the provider. Um, and so we were able to go and do some program observation with our, with our existing staff. Um, so Gazwan, I don't know if Gazwan is on the line, but Gazwan, um, who played an instrumental role in our Arabic speaking work, um, was able to, to host one of our prototype researchers, Abdul, who is on the line, um, to go and do program observations um, to see what it's like for the men who are participating in an employment program. And we were able to conduct one more interview. And that's where this idea of a business planning tool that doesn't just talk about the sort of structural pieces of you need a business plan and you need financials, but what is it like that how is that business that you might own or you might co-own or you might franchise, what does that look like for your family? What is the intersections that it has with your finances, with the roles that people are expecting you to play, the roles you're expecting others to play? Um, and we're continuing to, to design and refine that work um, from, from where, we, where we started. Um, and then with Filipino youth, there were about 15 interviews conducted. And again, there were specific pain points addressed around youth employment and peer support. Um, and some of the, the more emotional pieces around the changing of roles, um, having really hard family conversations once you've arrived here and difficult decision making that might come up around, um, should you go to school or should you get a job? Um, and so there was two prototypes that came out of that. One was the, a podcast called Moms Let's Talk and another one that was the Youth Researcher Program. So I just wanna talk a little bit about Mom Let's Talk. Um, so this was a podcast that was designed by our niche um, staff, so settlement workers, Ella and Maria Espina, who I don't know if either of you are on the line, but, um, but a creation where the separation and reunification of Filipino moms specifically who came to Canada because of the Living Caregiver Program, who are being reunified with their kids, which is often happening five, 10 years after their initial separation, are having trouble connecting and having conversation. And so there are three podcasts online that you can actually go and listen to about the, the sort of like the background and the history of what um, is happening there, but coming from settlement workers and moms and youth talking about those experiences and trying to spark ways to like, just say like, hey, I might be experiencing this and I don't even know how to start this conversation. And so these podcasts came out last November um, and, and we're, we're still in the pro process of trying to figure out what comes next, but they were an amazing way to start um, putting something out there to say, yeah, we know that this is a problem, we know we want to address it. Here's one way that we might be able to put a solution out there. It's not at, at any means someone saying this is the, the, um, the only solution to this conversation, um, but it was our first prototype um, within the, with the Filipino um, families. And then we have the Youth Researcher Program. Um, so like I said, we had 21 youth researchers join us. These are all Filipino youth who are in some way impacted because of the live-in caregiver program, um, whether their mom or their spouse was a living caregiver, and then they came um, sometimes separated for long periods of time and sometimes not as long. But every single one of these experiences helped us learn a little bit more about what's happening with, with Filipino youth. Um, and rather than me talk about it, um, oh, apparently I am gonna talk about it a little bit more. There are some structural things um, involved with the youth researcher program. There's a time commitment. So we had, we had asked youth researchers to 
um, sign six week contracts with us. We did have budget. These are just some of the very structural things that were needed to be able to do this role, to do this program. We had $20 an hour for 20, $20 an hour for 20 hours per researcher. That was our budget. We offered 21 positions and the only prerequisite was that you had to have lived experience. So you needed to be a Filipino youth and you needed to have, and or you needed to have experience with the live-in caregiver program. Um, and so those are like the very like structural things that you would put on paper for like a grant application. Um, the program goals were around data collection um, and turning individual stories, much like Mathura talked about earlier, turning those quotes and those stories into physical artifacts and evidence for developing programs um, and services. And then being able to actually co-design those programs and services with the people we're designing for and have them be a part of the process and help to generate the solutions. Oh, why am I still talking? Uh, then there's curriculum. There's the training aspects of this, which is the orientation and the researcher tools. Um, there's the data collection. We embedded all sorts of questions in the job applications, the research activities, the research teams, the toolboxes, the one-on-one -on -one interviews. These are all really physical things. These are all the tool pieces that we embedded into the work. Um, we did host two design labs online because our first design lab was scheduled for March 14th and everyone knows what happened on March 12th. Um, and then we had a peer and staff feedback session since we've been online as well as we, we've started prototyping what the programs and services could look like with our youth researchers. We had community, we had Slack, we intentionally set up a tool where this, the, we could stay connected with everyone and they could stay connected with each other. And then there's this peer-to-peer -peer support that emerged that um, we hadn't really planned for, but it's there. Um, and so we think that those are sort of like the structural pieces that were needed to sort of recreate as much as possible this process. That being said, we don't think this is a recipe for recreating a co-design process with everyone, um, but this is what worked for us in this moment. Just to add to that really quickly, um, one thing that Jen mentioned before was this asset-based approach. And if we go back to the previous slide where mm -hmm. we talk about community, like the community we planned was on Slack um and you know creating a brave space when everyone's in the room but the community we didn't plan and that showed up from that those assets that youth in this community carry was the peer-to-peer -peer support like people supported each other without us prompting and that's kind of what we mean by an asset-based approach like people inherently have these strengths communities inherently have these strengths and how do you create space for those to emerge and when they do emerge how do you give them um, the importance and the, and the space to thrive. Thank you. I feel like we've reverse laid down these slides, <laughs> but we'll get through these structural pieces and then you'll get to hear from the actual youth researchers. Um, so we went into the youth researcher program with three program areas that the staff had already identified, which was pre-arrival services, peer-to-peer -peer support, and intergenerational support. And what emerged out of the youth researchers work was what these programs could look like if they were actually designed by the people who they would be serving. And we actually ended up with a fourth program emerging, which is the youth divorce support. Um, and so these are all continuing to be in emergence. So when we started planning this um, presentation, we were talking about four programs. We are now talking about the, the um, emergence of actually one program that sort of connects these four areas and that while you're in a program you actually might be connected into an additional part of the community that only you need so like the youth divorce support for example is not going to be meant for every filipino youth because not every filipino youth experiences being a part of a divorced family but it is something that happens enough um, that we knew that it was something we wanted to build in intentionally into our programming okay this is the part where I'm trying to get to, which is letters to our future youth researchers. So one of the things that um, we did was we really embedded a lot of reflection moments into the, the programming. And so um, these are four of our youth researchers from the youth researcher program. Um, they, they participated in writing future letters to future youth researchers as a part of our initial design lab. Um, they've now written 
second versions um, and are going to give us their experiences as being a part of the, the program. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Louise. Louise is going to share her, her letter first. Okay, hi everyone. Okay, I'm gonna read my letter to a future U researcher. Um, hi, I'm Louise. I was part of the U researcher team on 2020. First of all, I want to say that I am really thankful that I was part of the U researchers at Niche to help research what Filipino community or Filipino youth in particular needs through my lived experience. To be honest, when I first started being a youth researcher, I was not sure how I can help Niche with providing the information that will be needed or if even I'm going to enjoy this job, quote unquote. <laughs> and I'm sure that you are just as just as nervous as just as just I was before right now. But let me tell you something amazing. As the time progressed, I saw so much value by being a youth researcher. I built relationship not only between the youth researcher, but as well as the staff at Niche, and I loved it. My experience in being a youth researcher is so different from my past jobs. I was able to resonate with other youth researchers' stories and was really happy to get to know them a little bit better and listen to their important and memorable stories in their lives. I realized that yes, we do have the same reason why we are here, which is to live in caregiver program, but our stories are different. The interesting part is that though our stories are different, we understood each other. So don't worry, you are not alone in this journey. You have the other researchers with you. Soon you will be assigned to a group consisting of three to four people where you will all be interviewing Filipino youth that experience live in caregiver program and use different materials that we've used before. These tools will be a great help for you and your team, so make sure to use them well. I realized that we were able to collect data and information that then helped the program that we planned. Within the interviews that I had in my team and from the other Filipino youth that I knew, we realized that most Filipino youth have experienced or may be experiencing divorce or separation in their family. Most of the people that I interviewed have their mom here with them, but their dads are in the Philippines. Most of these youth are still having a hard time coping and are still hurt because of these changes in their lives. I realized that most of them suppressed their feelings down their heart. So when we talked about their family, it was, very, it was a very sensitive topic for them which is why we considered planning a program that are specifically for them. I know that this youth, youth divorce support will help this youth to, actual, to actually heal from their hurtful past and hope that this program will help them be more confident with themselves and really accept that this is their lives now. I am really happy that I am part of this innovation and I'm happy to be able to share my lived experience experience and help the program to be as authentic as it can be for Filipino youth that will be using this program. <laughs> so be proud that you're a youth researcher because it is an important role for our community. Thank you. All right, so hi everyone. Thank you for coming to this uh, webinar. So Mark, one of the youth researchers as well, I'm going to be sharing my experience and my thoughts. So um, first of all, I'm incredibly grateful and blessed to be part of this program. And I'm sure that future researchers will share the same sentiment. Um, coming into this program, I knew we were going to research about the Filipino youth and teams, but I was not sure exactly how we were going to approach the research, especially that this was more experimental. I was a bit nervous because of that. But on the first day when I met the team, they made sure we felt reassured and supported. I also knew that my lived experience as a Filipino youth immigrant would play a part in my role as a researcher, but I quickly realized that the Filipino youth researchers are also a major part of those being researched. I was surprised, but I was pleasantly surprised since it was unique and in this field of work. Um, there was enough structure in the program, but there is also enough freedom for us to be authentic. I also haven't heard of other organizations doing participatory research within the Filipino community. I was excited and curious to what this program will result into. Most of the programs for the youth and minority groups are one size fits all. And I have always felt that certain culture and the ones that were ignored sometimes purposely, and there is still a lot of improvement and innovation. I felt that more attention should be given to um, the culture and the and how it plays a role in the issues. Um, I've heard many different stories and experiences of being a Filipino youth and each one as important as the other. I've learned so many from my fellow colleagues and my supervisors. I noticed that there are a lot of feelings of being misunderstood and heard. 
However, the team made us feel valued, heard, and supported as we worked together. The fact that NYCH included Filipino youth to research and create programs and services for Filipino youth shows how sincere and passionate they are in helping the community. The creativity and passion exemplified by this program is something that I think should be emulated. And I'm sure this experience will be helpful in creating innovative programs and services for different types of communities. I'm relieved that there are people willing to understand the Filipino youth and their issues deeply and incorporate that to action research. Um, the diversity of Canada requires diverse and creative solutions and this program is an attempt towards that. I genuinely believe that this program will lead beneficial and innovative results and hope that the future program service implementation considers what we are doing. I hope that this program results in, ter in services that are more effective and culture conscious in helping the Philippine community and other communities. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, right. Daisy. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, if I could describe my experience as a youth researcher in one word, it would be transformative. Um, I've learned what it means to truly belong to and uplift my community and I find that I've found the confidence to ask the hard questions and to usually find the even harder answers and and um, more than anything I felt strong and supported as I've continued to explore who I am. Uh, following a mental health crisis in 2016, I found myself desperate for a connection and community. And it wasn't until I started to reconnect with my roots and my heritage that I finally began feeling some sense of comfort and healing. Uh, so I came into this program hoping that I could strengthen my bond with the Filipino community, that I would finally figure out what it means to be Filipino in the context of these lands, and that I could somehow start the much needed conversation about mental health with other Filipino youth. Uh, but I also came into this program afraid that my story would be too different, that my peers would dismiss me because there are parts of my story that are definitely considered taboo in our culture. And this was, after all, the typical response that I had received in the past. And I really wish that I had given them more credit. My team not only validated my experiences, but they also began sharing and validating their own experiences too. And we gave ourselves permission to share, to feel, and to be with each other. And in these quiet moments of gentleness, vulnerability, and sharing, I realized that we were not only becoming a team and community, but we were also beginning to create meaningful change together. Although the work was challenging at times, the Youth Researcher Program has taught me to trust my team and myself to honor the process of things as well as the results. And most importantly, it showed me the value in sharing our stories. I hope that the work we've done will uplift and empower Filipino youth to be and do the best that they can in every aspect of their lives. And I trust that my team will continue to uplift our community even now as we come to a close. As youth researchers and now as a community, we've worked together to advocate for better for all, for all of us, um, imperfectly, but very much intentionally. And I think that's exactly how it was meant to be. Thanks, everyone. Now we have Sarah. Sarah. Hi, can you guys hear me properly? Yeah, yeah we, we can. can. Yeah, you can? Okay, awesome. Well, basically, in my experience, well, it's my first time ever experiencing working on something like this. It's like, you know, you used to work at McDonald's or in summer camps, but with this, it's just completely different. It's like a, a think tank, basically. We, we, were, we were coming up with ideas. Um, it's awesome. Mitch created a project where we could create programs that specifically catered to a specific people, the Filipinos in general. And the people that are hired, which, which is us, have direct experience like, connected to what we're doing. It's been an absolute pleasure working here. I've learned a lot and enjoyed every minute of it. I love talking and coming up with, coming up with ideas with you guys. I love listening to your stories. The way we brainstormed, it's like, you know, we're just speaking and then we come up with ideas. We write, we write down notes. We just throw, throw, throw around thoughts to come up with the best possible plan. I love that whenever, whenever we enter the space of communication, I felt safe. I felt that I can open up and say whatever I can without anyone judging me. I wish every organization or workplace was like this. Filipinos in general are not known to talk like we do during our conversations. It's magnificent that we spoke the way we did. Like, you know, honestly, with passion. In homes of Filipinos with, with family or with friends, based on my experience, it's rare to talk about our emotions. It's taboo, as Daisy said earlier. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a Filipino stereotype that needs to be deb debunked. 
mental health that's some that's something that we actually talked about on a constant basis it's a uh, it's something that we that i see niche actually cares about the way we the way Mathura grounded us earlier that's act, that's actually amazing it's like one of the most important topics that that we should talk about and we actually did it's amazing how the programs that we've thought of refurbished and are improving are coming to fruition that's like something that I, that i actually accept in general it's like a it's amazing it's actually coming through. Now we are doing a presentation to more than 100 people. It's, uh, it's exciting and it makes me nervous at the same time. Uh, but yeah, it feels awesome to be doing something bigger than myself, to be involved in something like this, to be involved in something that has the potential to change a lot of lives. And who knows how big the, this program could be? Who knows how many people it could affect? If there's a chance that this program would be even bigger and that I could help even more, I would love to be there to help. Oh my goodness. As I say again, these programs that we have done are directly catered to Filipinos. Like if, if it was me that was going to be affected by this program about what, five years ago, my life would be completely different now. The people leading this project, like Mathura, Jen, everyone else, care about their employees. Like every time I was here, I felt like, uh, as I said earlier, I'm in a safe place. They care about the result and they care about uh, the people that we're targeting. Based on the presentation, so they bring, they bring honor to the word non-profit non -profit organization. It's amazing, really. And should be heard. Like uh, what we're doing should be heard. It, like uh, it should be up. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to word it. Well, I'd love to get feedback from the people listening to our presentation. And I'd love to like, you know, hear everyone's opinions if they're your, or answer people's questions. Constructive criticism is always accepted. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, thank you. So now you know why Jen was rushing to, to just get through her slides so we could hear from the youth researchers. They are the lifeblood <laughs> of of you know of this uh, of this work they're why we do it they are the work they have produced so much of what what you see today um, and they continue to inspire us before I get into what works Jen you are like beaming do you want to say something? I know I'm so excited <laughs> I mean the so we worked with with 21 youth researchers for a six-week contract and then we extended four four more contracts for these four youth researchers and every week you all blow me away i'm gonna get emotional um that that we're doing this work and that we're actually able to make the change that you're talking about in your in your letters and that hopefully we can continue to do this for others um and that you're all going to be a part of growing it because you been a part of making it happen. Um, so I just want to thank each of you for being a part of this and being on this journey and for being a part of this experiment with me because every week we we were learning something new together. We were um, experimenting. You were all taking leadership in so many ways. Um, when our technology failed, Eros was on it like before <laughs> we could even think about new solutions. So I think that like the the community that you all got out of this i feel like i also got that okay now you can go on to the whole <laughs> <laughs> uh you know you, you basically heard the meat of our presentation but as a way of kind of tying together what worked and why we wanted to highlight some key themes that came up for us um that made this program successful and one of the things that kind of threads throughout the whole thing is being responsive to what shows up. And the youth researcher program was roughly four weeks with um, the four folks that you see here get, um, coming on for an extended contract. And we had a rough plan for what we would do across the four weeks, but every time we had a session with the youth, we would end with exit tickets and each week the ticket would look different. So one week we asked, um, what did you learn? What other questions do you have? What more would you like to learn? And based on what we heard from what more they wanted to learn, we changed the next session. So we flipped around some of the activities to um, address that skill. So a lot of them were like, we don't really have practice interviewing people. And before we go out and interview others, we want to like take on the different roles that that entails. So we created an activity in the next 
in, in, the, in the first design lab that allowed them to practice taking on different roles uh, within the context of their team so they could have that practice in a safe environment. And a lot of that comes from not being so attached to what you said you would do, um, having a general plan, but then being responsive to, to what shows up. And I think that's also a way that we build trust. Um, when people have shared something and they see that you've listened, um, that makes people feel seen and heard and want to show up again and share more feedback. Um, the other thing was building in reflective practice throughout rather than throwing in an evaluation at the end. And I think one thing that's really important to us, as much as data collection was a program goal, there are, we learned and it was important for us to make sure that data collection was bi-directional uh, in terms of the energy exchange and how people felt supported. It's not you giving us data so we could get your data and understand you better. It's that's happening as well, but we also want the tools that we're using to have some sort of benefit for you, some sort of value for you, some sort of um, structure for you to process your own experiences and possibly heal and talk about it through those, um, through those tools. So for example, the letter to the future youth researcher that um, all of the youth did, that was a way for us to understand youth experiences through the program, but it was also a way for youth to sit down and really um, think about, you know, what was I thinking when I walked in that first day? Um, what were some of the things that I was worried about and how has that changed? So, you know, getting outside of the fact that interviews have to be a certain way, we have to ask a certain number of questions, we have to collect this data and thinking about it as a bi-directional relationship, like how do you give to the people that are giving to you? Um, if we could skip to the next slide. Yeah. Um, the other thing that was really important was building a sense of ownership and leadership within the youth. Um, so this is not something that they're doing for us, but rather something that they're doing for themselves. And again, um, you know, one example that um, we can share from our program was this idea of profile cards. So within the design world, um, profile cards are often a tool that is used um, by researchers often in the back end. Once you have a sense, once you've collected a bunch of data about your participants, you go back and you create a profile card that you know, when someone reads the card, they'll learn about a persona or a specific participant. Um, and what we did was kind of flip that on its head and we gave the youth a series of questions that might, you know, appear in a profile card. And we asked them to write their own profile card. And that in itself gives them agency over how they're portrayed. I think a lot of the times, researchers on the back end or designers on the back end have the power to shape people's narratives. And when we do that, we project our own experiences and our own assumptions onto that. So it may not really be how that person might want themselves portrayed. And in giving youth the um, ownership over that, that meant that, you know, all of our templates didn't look exactly the same because some, some questions people skipped because they didn't feel like they were relevant. So yes, we may not have the pretty consistent template, but we have profile cards that the youth feel like are reflective of their experiences. And they even asked um, if, they, if the profile cards could be something that they could come back to and continue to iterate on. Because you know, once a profile card is made, it doesn't mean you know, that person's life is over. Their lives are continuing to evolve. So what does it look like to create a system where they can continue to feed back into that profile card and show us how they're growing, how they're learning, how they're changing, and how their needs are changing. And if we're using those profile cards as a way to design or as an input into programs and services, then they're constantly being updated by the people who are having the experiences. Um, and then the last thing I'll share is probably something you've heard as a thread through all of the letters that the youth have shared is um, creating opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, I think we were lucky that the group kind of just gelled and were able to support each other naturally and inherently. Um, but on our end, we did think about, um, you know, some of the things that come up with group dynamics generally across any population. And we tried to design uh, in a way that we would give them the vocabulary and the tools to have the kinds of conversations they might need to have in order to work together as a group and move through conflict. So for example, um, we had them all in their teams go through a research charter. And in that we provided questions and vocabulary like, 
you know, what are the roles that you play outside of this job? Um, what time does that, what time and energy does that take from you? What kind of boundaries do you need around this job so that you can thrive? Um, how do you like feedback communicated to you? Um, how do you like us how would you like to know that you have been seen or heard? Like these are questions that all teams everywhere should be talking about. Um, but knowing that for a lot of the youth, this was one of their first employment experiences, we felt it was important to kind of seed some of these fundamental questions around how you support each other as a group. Um, and, and they really rose to the occasion. Yeah, I think just to, to, to add to that is the, it may not have been first jobs, like Eros was talking about, you've worked at McDonald's, right. you've worked at camp, but to be a researcher, to be a part of something because of your own lived experience, that was unusual. I mean, I've never even done that. So we wanted to make sure that we were putting in tools for roadblocks that we thought might happen. How many times have you been in a team and you haven't talked about expectations and then the expectations blow up in your face? So we wanted to make sure that we were putting in tools to be like, remember when we already talked about expectations? This is us revisiting that. We're not at all saying that those tools stopped anything from blowing up in teams or that there weren't hiccups or that there weren't learning moments, but that we were hoping that we could put in things to start conversations that you may not have otherwise. Um, so the research spectrum, which we also sort of modeled um, in one of our orientations, asked about is research done better um, alone or in a group and that didn't come from us that came from actually the job applications that our youth researcher shared with us we asked them about what's good research and what's bad research and then we use those questions to create a conversation in a research spectrum so we said like i said is it is research in better as an individual or in a group and so everyone sort of flocked to as a group thinking like, okay, that's like the, the right thing to say. Mathura gave full on permission to go straight to the other end, which is to say, no, research is better as an individual. You get to control everything. You get to do it in your own time. And then people started like going that way and being like, oh, is it okay to say that? Um, and so what it ended up doing is giving us tools and permission um, and to actually be like, I can be honest. And when I'm honest, then we actually get to have a real conversation. It isn't about how do I make sure I show up so that people judge me less? It's actually how do I show up with my authentic experiences and my thoughts and then have a conversation starting from there. And I don't think that happens in every job place, let alone a program. So, <laughs> so into it. Um, so kind of as like a thread tying it all together, um, we reflected a lot on our role throughout this process and ultimately our role is to facilitate and in this context it means that we may have ideas of our own but this is neither the time or the place for them this is about the youth researchers and this is why we brought them on board they have the lived experience that no matter what we've studied or what experiences that we've had we will never know and for us this meant putting our egos aside um, truly sharing decision making. So when they said something didn't work, then trusting that it didn't work and um, pivoting accordingly. And then responding to emerging gaps and opportunities that maybe we didn't see beforehand. And this meant <laughs> that we changed things every couple of weeks. It meant that we had to go back to our finance department and be like, hey, listen, in order for us to be responsive to this need, we may have to structure this this budget line um, or this pay or whatever it is, but we think this is what will um, provide the most impact, which is ultimately what the project is around. And that can be a muscle that we're not used to flexing, um, particularly if that hasn't been like put into the grant or we haven't done this kind of work before. But I think we were lucky at a niche where, you know, people were willing to step outside of their comfort zones for us. And what was most important on our end um, was documenting why we made the pivots that we did so that when we were asked to justify both from like a funding perspective but also um you know one of you may ask us now like why did you choose to go this way we've been documenting throughout so we can go back and say oh during this design lab we did this activity and a lot of the youth shared that we should kind of focus on this over this and it's important to kind of keep a trail of that just so we're not 
changing for the sake of changing, but actually rooting those and rooting that in evidence that has actually shown up in, in our work with the youth. Yeah, I think the flexibility was so key to this work because we don't, we don't know what it's going to look like when we start a project. Um, I'm just really mindful of time and the fact that we do want to share space with everyone who's here, but I also want to share this moment with Shelley to talk a little bit about our lessons learned, our sort of grand lessons learned, I guess. Um, it's 2.35, so um, hopefully we can get to questions really soon. Okay, Jen, I get the <laughs> message, I'll make it quick. <laughs> Oh, I wasn't subtle enough. <laughs> See how open we are? She can just have to do it whatever way she wants PED to do it. Anyhow, um, so, but it sort of comes into our lessons learned, I think, sometimes. Uh, so I'm just going to be quickly uh, go through the less, some of the lessons learned. And you've heard a lot from uh, Mathura and Jen and the amazing youth researchers. Wow, they just blew me away. Um, but I'm just going to, this is probably the most boring part, but I just want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons we've learned as an organization. And some of them are somewhat similar or have, have been mentioned, but I think it's important to frame it from an organizational and a senior leadership point of view. Uh, so one of the first is, and we talked a bit about it, is pivoting is okay and is often really needed. Uh, when you have a project and, and doing innovation for almost two years, uh, what you what you always thought of what it would be done when you when you develop the application can change. So sometimes it's scary to make um, changes in the middle of the project, but it's really important to be to do that if you really feel that um, uh, change will will make will make the project better or will have more impact in some way. So it's sometimes hard to do, but it's really important to do it. Um, another thing is um, that I want to I want to say to those of us in uh, the nonprofit sector and especially in the settlement sector, is our sector already has lots of experience being adaptable and nimble, uh, and we should build on that. Over the years, we've developed lots of new programs, and because we don't usually have lots of resources, we've had to find creative ways to make them happen. So let's build on it and then push it further. Um, we sh we also, we shouldn't just think about innovation and programs. We've talked a lot about that today, but we also need to look at opportunities for innovation and in how we work in policies and procedures and HR, et cetera. Um, and also, as I said before, around our approach to innovation, but I can't say it enough, it's so important to have a learning mindset and to have a kind of a critical eye. Uh, we need to be open to learning new things uh, we need to be open to admitting that something isn't working anymore and or isn't working well enough and it needs to be changed or done differently. I think sometimes in our sector we have a program that's been working really great, we have done wonderful work and it's hard to come to the terms that maybe it's not the, the best program at this time. Maybe we need to change it or do something totally different. Uh, a really big one, and especially I think for those of us in senior leadership who um, sometimes have um, some issues around control, is we need to be comfortable with ambiguity. And that's hard. Um, often in this work, or pretty much all the time in this work, you're not sure what's going to happen. And for many of us, as I said before, it's hard. Uh, sometimes we want more control or we want to know how something's going to turn out. But we're, when we're in the innovation space, we don't know how it'll turn out and we have to give up some control. So as a, an ED or a senior leader, we need to trust our staff and we don't need to know every detail. And we also especially need to trust the community. We need to trust our clients, our participants, and know that that, that, they're, that they're experts in many ways. They're experts in, in, in what they need and what they want and what would work. And they need to be a critical, critical uh, partner in innovation. And you saw that so clearly in the um, experience with youth researchers. And um, the last thing is um, many of us in the sector look to innovation experts to lead. And uh, there are many consultants and innovation experts, 
uh, that have really good knowledge and good experience and tools, and uh, we can learn a lot from them, and they can help us a lot. But they can only uh, do so much, and they only know so much. As I said before, we are in organizations, we have lots of knowledge too. Not only do we have our own experience and innovation, we know our community, we know our clients, we understand the situations, and if we've been doing a really good job, we have their trust. So this knowledge and connection is so important. So I'm gonna leave it there and get back so we can have time for questions and comments. Yeah, so what's next? Um, we do have an evaluation happening right now. We're working with a team of external evaluators to help us document what happened and what we should be striving to do next. Um, we're trying to continue to learn by doing um, and sharing our tools and our processes with our staff to implement them into existing programs and services. We already have staff saying, you know, you did this, my life as a river tool, which was a really great reflection moment. Is there a way I can integrate, inter integrate that into <laughs> a program that I already am doing because I think that might be a, a good way to have youth do some reflection or the profile cards um, for some of our community development workers are thinking about how do we actually bring the profile cards into other action learning and other um, community development work so that there is that ownership over your own narrative and that and and how you're you're participating in some of that work um, and for us to be action leaders um, committing to sharing externally and internally about our process and lessons learned um, similar to this session which hopefully I will be better at technically the next time I do it um, and then testing the model. So we, we, we piloted a co-design program um, to design programs and services with newcomers, but it isn't a recipe. We don't know if we were to do exactly the same things that we would end up with the exact same solution um, or the exact same results. Um, it's about people and it's about timing and it's about things coming together that you can't always account for. Um, and so we need to keep going and we need to do it again. Um, we are going to move into moderated questions because we imagine at this moment you might have some questions. Mathura, you had a question about uh, populations that I think Shelly might be able to answer. Right. Oh, sorry. And in the meantime, while Shelly is answering, if other folks want to pop back into the chat boxes, um, feel free to start doing that. And then I think we'll probably pivot to open space pretty quickly. Um, and so you can raise your hand up if you do have a question. But in the meantime, Mathura, can you share this question with us? Sure. Um, someone had asked, how did you determine that Arabic men and Filipino youth were the hardest to reach populations? Uh, was this done through stats and da data research? They were just curious. Sure. Um... So I, I, I'm not sure if we'd say the hardest to reach um, because we haven't, you know, compared all the groups that we work with and we work with a really large um, group of people from a variety of ethnocultural backgrounds. Um, but I think there were two groups that we were finding um, that we were finding that um, we were doing some good work, but we really felt we could do more. Um, we had been doing a, quite a bit of work with the Syrian community um, and Syrian refugees and felt that we were really able to engage Syrian women, but Syrian men were much more difficult to engage. And so we thought there's got to be some new and different ways to do that. Uh, in terms of Filipino uh, youth and, and their parents in some cases, um, again, we had been doing quite a bit of work over the years for uh, Filipino uh, with Filipino youth and, and their parents. Um, but, we, um, uh, but we really again felt that, um, there, that we're only kind of hitting the surface and there is so, there's, there's got to be some better and creative ways to, um, to do this work and, and work with the communities. So that's why we chose those two. Um, um, that, you know, obviously other, other groups, other, other needs, but those were two that we felt like uh, we're doing some good work, but there's a lot more potential and we didn't need to think differently about how to do this work with them. Right. Thanks, Shelley. Um, that really helps to clarify that. Um, but 
we did want to make sure that we, we shared one more tool with you, which is exit tickets. So Mathura mentioned the exit tickets a couple times. That was where we started with our work um, with asking the youth um, at the end of our orientation if this is actually something you want. And then we, uh, and then we also did that when we were asking about um, what did you learn and what might you still be left with wanting to learn. Um, and so we're, we're gonna share a similar tool with you um, so the exit tickets, I can see people starting to jump back into the Google Slides. Um, so we have three questions for all of you, which is framed around a tool that's called what, so what, now what? And so really you want to use those to ask questions about what's happening right now, why does it matter, and what might you want to try? So again, you can jump into those slides. They start at 62. Um, and so at from 62 onwards is that first question, which is what did you learn today? Um, so what starts at 66, which is why does it matter? And then 60, no, nope, 70 is where now what starts, which is why might, what might you try? Um, and as people are sort of jumping into that, um, we don't have any raised hands. So maybe there is no questions or comments. Um, oh, Albert has a raised hand. I'm going to allow you to talk now, Albert. Hold on. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. Can hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 yeah we Is can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so first of all, thank you uh, to everybody for putting on uh, the webinar. This is really awesome and informative to see what you are doing. Uh, my question is actually for the four, uh, the four <laughs> youth um, that we have on the yeah, line. They're the stars. So Mark, Daisy, Arrows, Annabelle. Um, I've, I've actually got two questions, and, and they're kind of related. So, I mean, do your best, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the first is, um, you know, what training or tools were useful for you to not only just lean on your own lived experiences as youth researchers, but also kind of open-heartedly integrate the experiences of others. Obviously you were brought in because of your kind of lived experience as Filipino youth, but I'm sure that there were kind of stories or experiences that you heard from others that were like, I can't really relate to this. You know, this is not really my own life. And so how, you know, what was useful for you in being able to uh, separate those things, but also integrate them together in your research. So that's, that's number one. Number two, <laughs> sorry, I know it's kind of wordy. Number two is uh, uh, in terms of imagining solutions. So you kind of came up with four different uh, types of uh, services that could be used in a program. Um, it can be really easy for us to get locked into imagining what has already happened and not kind of be creative about what could be uh, in the future. So again, what kind of training or tools were useful for you in kind of brainstorming those different types of solutions? What kind of supports did you need for that to happen? Do any of you need clarifications on Albert's question? <laughs> Maybe Albert, start with like the, the part that you really want them to answer. Wait, it looks like Daisy unmuted. Did you want to say okay. something? Okay, you go Daisy. Somewhat of an answer. Um, I think going into this, I, you know, I had an idea that of course everyone's experiences are very different, but they're also still valid. And I found the self-reflection activities that we did as a group very helpful because it was a great reminder of that. Um, and, you know, by doing the self-reflection, we also, <clears throat> excuse me, we, I think, started to validate our own experiences. And by doing that, it also gave us the tools to validate each other's experiences and to listen and learn rather than tell or assume. It, it really kept us grounded. And, you know, I don't really know about training, but the activities that we did as a group were definitely helpful because they, they really brought us together um, and they gave us a space to just talk and share and connect without any sort of expectations. It was always an invitation. And I think that was very responsibly and wonderfully done um, by the team because we always had agency. We always had the choice as to whether or not we wanted to participate. And I think that's what, that's one of the big parts of why this was so successful. We had the choice. Thanks, Daisy. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> Yeah. Hi. Or Mark. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Daisy. I I just wanted to add on to that. 
like for tool for tools no, to add on to that and to answer your question for for tools in general what i love that we did was the interview part where i got to talk to like uh two group members which is luis and i forgot his name oh no and yeah <laughs> john, <laughs> so we basically just practiced yeah, john yeah so we basically talked about yeah, talked about ourselves in an open space like um we actually learned more about each other and i'm generally a uh, a talkative guy who is interested in people's stories. So basically, that that reinforces what I already know based on like uh, what I know from other from other people too. And it's like uh, I guess it's also a form of training because after that we actually went to interview other people as well. After and before that, I can't remember. But yeah, on the more official part when it comes to training, me personally, I'm part of a I'm part of two Filipino organizations. So basically, I know. In these organizations, we have different programs or like um, events as well, where people are, where we hold an open space so people can talk about their issues, basically. So I guess that's one thing. But yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. You can always chime back in if you think of something else. Uh, so I just want to add to question number one as well. Um, so there, definitely there's a lot of diversity of experiences within a community as well, not just between communities. And for me, organizing that formation does pose as a challenge. Um, however, um, we did it through tools such as um, first, I think becoming um, having permission to be vulnerable and open about those differences is a, a great way of starting it. But also I found that through these honest conversations that there are more similarities between lived experience and sufferings when you actually got to the root of it rather than differences. And so we try to focus on that in order to help a broader population compared to just helping like one specific individual. Um, but at the same time, I think those differences are important to be uh, va validated and heard of. And so everyone had permission to do that. And in every tool that we had, vulnerability was always encouraged. And so, yeah, that's how we dealt with that. Thank you. And and plus, when we came up with ideas and like the programs that we came up with, there were there were different problems that we needed to deal with, right? We were thinking about more, let's say, solutions and more like uh, programs that we could do, and some of it we could just generalize into one of the one of the programs that we were holding, that we were trying to refurbish, basically. Okay, <laughs> so just to add on, Eris, what Eris said a while ago was that I also like the interview part because we weren't just talking about ourselves but we're also listening to someone else's stories so we're only not focusing on our story but also we're taking in some information from the different youth that we interviewed so that one is like the best tool I guess that really worked for me and I really like and also I like the com like the communication between the four like five of us because with Jen too every week where <laughs> we just like we would like at the end of our meeting we would usually have like a homework where we think about things through the whole week and then when we come back in that's when we communicate again and we re like reiterate with uh, the ideas that we already have and then add on to the ideas that we had great those are awesome thank you so much okay so Thank you, Albert. So thank you for everyone who has popped into the exit tickets and participated in that. I feel like there's way less participation now than there was at the beginning, which I think is a sign of we're coming to a close. Um, so we were going to, if anyone has any like last minute burning questions, um, feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, I feel like this is a good time to sort of close and thank everyone for coming. Um, and you can reach out to us. 